Hi! I'm Mike, and I have a trunk. And in this trunk, I keep a lot of my favorite games. Do they get beat up in the trunk? You bet. Do I care? Not really. Except for my copy of Jamaica that got water damaged somehow. Anyway, here are my 41 favorite board games. Why 41? Figure it out, dum-dum. Number 41, Escape from 100 Million BC. Your time machine has crash landed in the age of dinosaurs. Pieces are scattered throughout the world. You have to find them and get them back. But, oh no, people are falling through time portals. Some of them famous, some of them not. Anything left behind, animate or inanimate, could alter the future, and will. Exciting. Number 40, Celestia. This is a neat little press your luck game. Somebody rolls the dice and then you have to decide, do they have cards in their hand that match the dice they rolled? How far are you willing to ride this airship before you bail? If you wait too long, oh the humanity! Just kidding, you land safely back at start. Number 39, The Quest for El Dorado. Do you like Indiana Jones? Do you like Uncharted? If you answered yes, you'll likely like this adventure that has you trekking through forests and deserts and swamps in search of the titular treasure. I know I do. Number 38, Century Eastern Wonders. I feel I'm in the minority when I say I wasn't big on Century Spice Road. It was just a bit too abstract for me. I like Eastern Wonders a lot more. Like, a lot. It's colorful, there's more to do, and I'm actually interested in what the next game in the series will look like now. Number 37, Cosmic Encounter. My group had a rough time with this game the first two or three times we played it. It didn't click, it, it wasn't working. We tried one more time and wow, everything fell into place. Maybe it was our powers before that stunk, maybe it was the powers this last time that meshed real well. I don't know, but I can't wait to play it again. Number 36, Star Wars Rebellion. Oh man, all the great stuff about the original trilogy without any of the crap from the prequel or that episode 4 remake. You get to blow up planets with a Death Star, how rad is that? The ultimate hide and seek game for the galaxy. Number 35, Caverna. This game feels heavy, literally and metaphorically. It's worker placement at its best, with amazing resource components to boot. Good luck fitting it all back in the box. Number 34, End of the Trail. Only played this one a couple of times, but one was a great experience towards the end of a long day at Origins. Sometimes that's enough to propel a game, you know? Number 33, Medieval Academy. This is a fun, light drafting game. You do like drafting games, right? Do I draft to win the tournament? Do I draft to court the princess? Or do I draft to educate the dumb or to help feed the hungry? One thing I don't ever draft though is the dragon. Number 32, Baseball Highlights 2045. Imagine baseball, but where the players have augmented themselves to perform better. Okay, so it's not that much of a stretch, but now add robots. Baseball Highlights plays fast, it's exciting, and it's not uncommon for the seventh game of the World Series to come down to the last card. Play ball! Number 31, Freedom, the Underground Railroad. In Freedom, you're shuttling slaves from southern plantations north to Canada. But wow, this game is tougher than nails, or railroad ties, or something. Fun fact, I've never beaten it. My friends say, I think we need to sacrifice some slaves next time. But I say, isn't one life lost too many? Number 30, Cutthroat Caverns. You and your friends are fighting your way out of a dungeon after finding the sacred item of unimaginable marvel. You work together, but if you want to win, you're going to have to step all over each other. We didn't play Cutthroat for six months to a year once because of the uncomfortable arguments it caused. <laughs> this game is mean. Number 29, Ink and Gold. Here's another light press your luck game as you have to decide how dangerous is too dangerous of an ancient ruin to explore before exiting with your share of the treasure. Half of the fun is calling your opponents chicken when they chicken out. Macaw! Number 28, Dice Settlers. Just played this one literally for the first time while making this list and wow, I had a great time with it. It mixes dice manipulation with a little bit of area control. The components, they, they might have been the upgraded ones from the Kickstarter, I don't know, but they looked awesome. Is it too early to slot it at 28? Maybe, but I expect to play this game a lot more. Number 27, Pandemic. 
a modern day classic and probably the gold standard for cooperative games. Have a friend who doesn't like the competitiveness of board games? Invite them over to fight deadly diseases like blue or yellow. But honestly, I think the most fun I've had in Pandemic is when everything spirals out of control and you suffer cataclysmic defeat. Number 26, Carcassonne. It wasn't until recently that I really got into Kark. I played it for the first time a few years ago with a group that knew it well, had, and used every expansion under the sun, and it was hard time for me, baby. I've gone back to it in the past year and was super surprised at how much fun I had with it with just the base set. Maybe it was another game that opened my mind to it. Number 25, Secret Hitler. I love social deduction games. In Secret Hitler, most of the table is not a Nazi. While some at the table are Nazis, and one is Hitler, Lizard Hitler. This is often very uncomfortable for Lizard Hitler, and oh so delicious for the liberals when they catch him. Who doesn't love killing Hitler? Number 24, Explore It, Valley of the Dead King. This game is like living a whole D&D character career out in one mission. You start with a bajillion combinations of races and classes and build yourself up from noob to OP in about an hour. Is it getting too easy? Up the difficulty mid-game. Or just start on very hard. I want to. Once. Number 23, Sagrada. Sagrada is a dice drafting game with tiny little colorful dice you arrange to create beautiful stained glass windows. Or in my case, often a beautiful stained glass window with a couple of holes in it from bad drafting or illegal placement. But when your pain comes together, mwah, magnifique. Number 22, Patriots and Redcoats. Another social deduction game, Patriots and Redcoats borrows a chunk of gameplay from Secret Hitler. But in this one, the worst you are is an Englishman. <laughs> you play around at cards trying to uncover which side people are on and the side you're on can actually change. It's maybe the only game in this genre where when you're the bad guy, you're not necessarily bad and you don't necessarily need to hide it. Great theme, great artwork, this one is always a hit with people. Number 21, Deception, Murder in Hong Kong. Social deduction game numero trace. Here you have one killer, one person who knows who the killer is, and a whole ton of potential evidence. The detective has to guide the players to uncover the killer and the correct evidence by using the vaguest of clues. This is stressful as heck when you are the murderer, and oh so satisfying when you win, no matter which side you're on. Number 20, Black Orchestra. It's World War II, and Hitler is reigning terror over Europe. You and your accomplices are undercover spies trying to hatch plots to capture the Fuhrer and end his reign. But until you do, you have to avoid not only Hitler, but like a million of his cronies running around. One time, I think we lost on the second turn. We were all thrown in jail. Another time, we killed Hitler. Who doesn't love killing Hitler? Number 19, Clank. Clank reminds me of the first time I heard about the Elder Scrolls. You mean it's like Doom, but with swords? Clank is like Dominion, but with a dungeon? Build a deck, go explore, fight monsters, steal what you can, and get out. But don't make too much noise or the dragon will hear you and attack. Seriously, the best part about playing Clank is pulling those cubes from the dragon's bag. Number 18, Isle of Sky. In Isle of Sky, you pull countryside tiles, put them up for sale, and buy with what you have left. If they don't sell, you buy it at the price you set. So do you sell at a buyer's price to make a profit? Or do you ask too much to keep your opponents from getting the piece you want to keep? It's Carcassonne with an auction, sort of, and you all play with your own board. Number 17, Thebes. In Thebes, you are an archaeologist digging for relics from the past. You do so by pulling a certain amount of tiles blindly from a bag. If I learned anything from this game, I learned that if I were a real life archaeologist, I would have a plus five skill to digging up dirt because that's all I ever find in those darn bags. A lot of fun though. Number 16, Luchador. I don't play Luchador enough. In Luchador, you chuck dice into a wrestling ring and use the attacks to weaken your opponent for a pinfall or submission. It plays really fast, it's a lot of fun, and whenever there's a pinfall attempt, you're likely to hear everybody screaming, one, two, oh, he kicked out. Number 15, Onitama. 
Onitama is like chess, if chess were fun. I love the mat, I love the pieces, I love the small shared move set in each game. You have two moves to make, and once you decide, you don't get that move back until your opponent plays it. Games take about 10 minutes tops, and you'll often play several in a row. Take that, chess! Number 14. Pathfinder Adventure Card Game Rise of the Rune Lords. Oh, did we have a blast playing through this first Pathfinder card game set. You build a deck of cards that carry over to 30 or so missions with each mission holding the possibility to swap out weaker cards for stronger ones permanently. My friends and I ate this game up. The next set, a bit of a letdown, but Rise of the Rune Lords, awesome to the end. Number 13, Seventh Continent. Oh, how I love this game, but I wish, even at 13, that I loved it more. It's brutally difficult. I don't know how people win without cheating. I've mapped it out. I've gotten to the end of the first curse, only to discover I'm basically Jon Snow. I know nothing. There's some great storytelling in this game, and it even had me considering learning German. If you've played, you might know why. Can't wait for the expansion. Number 12, Love Letter. Yeah, people see Love Letter in the little red satchel and think, come on. But when you open it up, you discover maybe the most balanced card game ever. Every card has a use, and there's a counter to every card. Everybody I've talked to loves it. It's inexpensive, it's quick, I keep an extra copy in my coat's breast pocket just in case people want to play, wherever I am. Number 11, MLB Showdown. This is a blast of the past. We played 5 plus homebrewed seasons of this CCG years ago, keeping stats, record books, updated standings each week. We'd vote all-star teams, MVP, Cy Youngs. We made home fields on poster boards. I would hang banners on mine following championship seasons. The way games played felt realistic. It made your week when you won and ruined your week to lose. Number 11, Cordier. Or is it Cordier? Cordier is the much less known canonical prequel to Love Letter. In Love Letter, you're writing the princess because she's bummed out her mom is in jail. In Cordier, you not only find out why she's in prison, but you're the one responsible for putting the queen away. It's a totally different game, it's pure worker placement, and something about it just fires off all the little things in my head that make me say, Ooh, let's play Cordier. I can't explain it. Number 9, Orléans. Orléans is a bag drafting worker placement game. You put your little dudes in a bag, draw some out, sprinkle them around France, and recruit more little dudes to throw back in your bag. Every time I play, I think I'm going to try a new strategy, like stop ignoring the boatmen, or stop ignoring unique tile locations, but I never do. More roads and boats and cheese and wine, s'il vous plaît. Number 8, Champions of Midgard. Champions is worker placement where you collect Viking dice and use them to do Viking things, like hunt trolls and draugr and fear some mythical beasts on the sea. I like the blame mechanic, where if you're the one who fights the troll, you can assign negative points to an opponent because they weren't brave enough to defend the village. Number 7, Blood Rage. More Vikings. Blood Rage starts as a card drafting game. How you draft largely determines the path you will take as you fight and pillage your way across Asgard for the glory of Valhalla? I'm sure I'm screwing that up. There are many paths to victory. Do you draft large monsters, small monsters, quests, attack cards, or do you try to lose your way into overall victory? Yeah, it can happen. Blood Rage! Number 6. Roll for the Galaxy. A big hit in my group. If you've ever had to teach this game to people, I'm sorry, I know your pain with that one rule. But I tell people, hey, you'll have it by the end of your second turn, and they usually do. Super colorful, plays fast, everyone's taking their turns at the same time, and the best part? Shaking a handful of dice in the cup in front of your friend who only has one in there. Clackety clack clack clack! Number 5, Gloomhaven. I probably like Gloomhaven the least of all my friends, but whoa, I still like it a lot. It's basically murder Descent 2.0 for me. It's got a long campaign. Character leveling, retirement, secret boxes and envelopes, and the designer figured out a logical method for enemies to behave so that we could all fight through the crypts and catacombs on the same team. If only setup and teardown didn't take a half hour each. Gloomhaven can only be described as epic. Number 4, Star Wars Destiny. 
Star Wars Destiny, I believe, may be filling that MLB showdown size hole in my heart. A collectible card game where you pick a team of heroes or villains from the Star Wars universe and then build a deck and battle your friends. Want to see how well Princess Leia teams up with her mom, Natalie Portman, and have them fight Director Krennic and the junk dealer from The Force Awakens? One quarter portion. Number three, Pandemic Legacy Season 1. It's pandemic, but with a campaign, and the game changes so much throughout. You're writing all over the board and ripping up cards, and okay, you may have hesitations about that, but get the stick out of your butt. That's what you're buying the game for. Oh my gosh, there are twists and turns and secret envelopes and boxes and scratch-off cards and something new behind every turn. So much fun, it may have set too high a standard for legacy games. Number two, Dominion. The granddaddy of deck builders. The near infinite possibilities of deck combinations drew me in years ago and I am still always up for a game. Just a suggestion and my eyes will light up. When you've got people who know how to play, it moves. You're just bang, 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 bang around the table. Let's play again. Even with, I have seven expansions, my favorite strategy is still big money. Is big money boring? I don't know. Is winning boring? Number one, the resistance. When I think about board gaming, the times that stick out most in my mind are the ones that come from playing this game. When you're a spy, your heartbeat picks up and you know, I gotta be on. Sowing doubt in others at the table, befriending people just to turn on them. How many times have we sat across from each other yelling, you're a dirty spy, no you're a dirty spy, I'm blue, I'm true blue. And the conversations that occur when the game is over. No game has provided more fun, shock, outrage, disbelief, and laughs for me in the past few years than this game. That's why The Resistance is my favorite game of all time.